Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Love Hour podcast. I'm your host, Miss Kev on stage, and I'm joined by my husband and co-host. The Kev on stage. And I actually do have one more episode for the infertility series. Um, the lady that I originally got, her husband's actually a firefighter, which I think is cool. Mm. Like, how many firefighters do you know? Three. You're lying. No, the, I really do. You know three real-life firefighters yeah. right now today. Who are the first and last names? Um, you know you don't know people's first and last names on the internet. Uh, but Charles Sachs Murray, Charles Murray, McMurray. Oh, he's a um he's firefighter. Oh, I didn't know that. Um Dennis Leary, he was in backdraft. And <laughs> right, right. Greg McMichael. <laughs> First of all, that means you know one and you don't know him, you know of him via the internet. I know him. How many times have you met him? I know him. That How many times have you met him in person? One, two, three, go. Lies. Two. If you can't, he was at the Charlotte fast, shows. He was at the Charlotte you, shows. No, the, the you don't need to know people in person. Yes, you do. No, I know. I know Jackie Anna, <laughs> and I only seen her one time, but she be talking to you on Twitter. <laughs> Forever we moon long. Yeah, you don't got to know nobody in person. You be. I know people on the internet. Uh, anyways, we are taking a break, like I said, from that series. We'll have another guest who um, actually had secondhand infertility, which is something that um, is quite common. And so we wanted to talk about that. And she eventually adopted. Really unique story. What do you What do you What's think? Secondhand infertility. Meaning you've had kids. Girl, <laughs> I was, I was like, I was thinking of secondhand smoke, and I was like, what? I didn't know nothing. <laughs> I'm not smart on Tuesdays. All right. So what we're going to do today as, again, just kind of a, a break in between is we have Dr. Anne Louise Lockhart. And uh, the reason why we have Dr. Anne Louise here with us today, number one, I'm a fan of her. She has two episodes I just found out on Therapy for Black Girls. Make sure you go check those out. Um, but the first one she was talking about, uh, I think you were talking about like reg uh, regulating with children, or I think you call it self-regulating. Um, co-regulation co-regulation that's exactly what you mm -hmm. called it because um, you would know and so um, <laughs> I actually really enjoyed that episode I immediately became a fan started following her um, from that moment but I reached out to her specifically because obviously in the world that we are living in with not only COVID and this pandemic and maybe we will touch a little bit on that too because I low-key be afraid of the long-term impact this will have on our kids like if oh if i'm gonna tell you like right now ptsd or you know there are gonna be hoarders episodes in the future that have that are starting because of covid right i feel like that's going to have mm -hmm. a long-term impact on these kids when they're when they're adults and especially adults. the younger ones you know yes it's like the dust bowl people grew up in oklahoma during the dust uh dust storms or something like that okay i don't know so i'm just letting you talk <laughs> Anyway, what school did you go to, doctor? So we have her here because <laughs> Evan and I, obviously, we have um, young black men, young black boys that we are raising. And we obviously had to have the conversation that I believe most black parents are having with their kids during this time. And I kind of had a fear that are we giving them too much information? Maybe not enough information. Are we traumatizing them? Are we setting them up to hate white people in the future? Like, how do we have these conversations and frame them in a way that's productive and healthy and not scarring? And so trying to find that balance, um, I felt was a struggle. And I'd imagine it would be a struggle for you know, most people out there. And so that's why I brought Dr. Ann Louise on because um, she's an expert in this. So before we kind of dive right into the episode, I wanted to give you the chance to introduce yourself and give us a bit of your background. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for having me on here. I really appreciate you reaching out. So um, I'm a pediatric psychologist and a parent coach and pediatric psychologist, just meaning that uh, I got training working with uh, kids who have medical diagnoses and who felt stuck in terms of getting help just from medication intervention. So then the psychological piece then was brought in. So people with like pain, headaches, stomach aches, all kinds of stuff, uh, seizures. And I uh, really specialize in that particular area. I work a lot with um, elite athletes and uh, high performing um, professionals. And then a lot with anxiety, as well as with parent coaches, um, or actually as a parent coach working with parents who have kids with a variety of concerns. So those are really my primary things that I do. And I have a private practice in San Antonio, Texas, 
working with um, for the past four years, and I have a several providers here, and we we do psychological testing, we do all kinds of neuropsych and ADHD testing, and then we also do therapy as well as parent coaching as well for the whole age range, including adults, and um, and yeah, so I've been married 21 years, almost 22. Nice. And my husband and I joke that we've never done anything that long. Like, it's like, man, that's a long time. That's <laughs> um, <laughs> Love it. Love it. And I was like, you know, I told him the other day, I said, I would not want to be quarantined with anybody else but you. Like, Aww. I genuinely like him. And that I, I could see how it would be a, a pain if you didn't. So love being married. I have two kids, a 10-year-old daughter and an almost eight-year-old son. And um, yeah, so and I'm originally from St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, born and raised there. Oh, and, really? Um, yeah, that's island girl background. Any relation to LaCroix? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I wish there was Not a Joshua all. camera for this right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and then I came to the States at 18 for college and been here ever since. Oh, you? So. Oh, nice. St. Yep. Croix is British Virgin Islands? No, it's, well, there is a British Virgin Islands, but I came from the U.S. Virgin the Islands. The U.S. side? US okay. Virgin so that's, is that near yeah. St. Thomas, St. Martin? Yeah. Saint, well, St. Croix, St. Thomas, St. John are the U.S. Virgin Islands. St. Martin is further down and they're French Dutch. Okay. Got and it. Franklin St., he is, he's selling crack in, in Snowfall. We've been watching that. Yeah. <laughs> We're clearly just uh, catching up on our uh, snowfall. <laughs> We're on the mid maybe. I'm trying to get my jokes off before we get into the subject because I know it's going to be downhill for the comedy <laughs> later. Um, really great show, by the way. But I have a question for you because you mentioned um, parent coaching. What exactly, can you dive into like what exactly that means, what that looks like? Yeah, definitely. So this is something that I kind of fell into a couple of years ago because I was like, you know, didn't know exactly what that was actually. And what it was is that what they found in a lot of the research is that working with kids with anxiety, behavioral issues, ADHD, that kind of stuff, yes, it is effective. But what we found is that parents really are the ones with their kids all the time, not the right. therapist, right? Mm -hmm. Not the teacher, it's the parent. And so right. when we can equip the parents with the tools they need to be able to have a relationship with their kid, including like the co-regulation, like you mentioned, Melissa, um, helping parents to monitor and manage their emotions and their right. thoughts and their behaviors, and then also giving them the tools on how to deal with their kids' anxiety or tantrums, behavioral issues, whatever it is, when the parents feel equipped and they feel more confident and they know how to break the cycles from their past, because if we all come with them, the generational cycles, the toxic things, the racial trauma, we come with all that stuff, and then we give it to our kids if we don't know any differently. And so it's about helping parents be equipped with the things they need so they can be a more effective parent. And that's what I do. And so that could be anything. That could be helping parents with anything. Um, I feel like Melissa is our parent coach for our kids. She is the one who yeah. is like, let's work through our feelings. Let's do this. And that I never thought of getting training from a therapist yeah, to be able to like reinforce those things. You know, um, mm -hmm. Melissa just does that by nature. Um, yeah. that is a very smart because you're going to be the ones there, like walking them through the, you know, um, those feelings and things like that. Well, the thing is, uh, I, I didn't even realize it, that actually I'm being coached. So I'm, I'm taking yeah. in a lot of information. <laughs> like literally I listened to your episode and even with my son, I'm managing, it's okay. Let's both take a deep breath because I need to take a deep breath. <laughs> Right. Let's let it out. And of course it's teaching uh -huh. him, but it's giving me a chance to like heart rate, calm down, nerves, yeah. settle down. Okay. Yeah. Let's, you know, and it gives me that chance to do that. And I, and I've learned this, of course, reading and listening to podcasts and those type of things. One of the things that I think is really important about this idea of being a parent coach or, or parents being coach is that kids don't come with a handbook. So we don't know what we're doing at all and so we literally do just pass down trauma and toxic traits that we learn because that's <laughs> yes. you know that's the university of life we went to was our own parent home life and so we're going to pass that down and if you need or if you want have the desire to break that you have to learn something different yeah and you can't just do that exactly. from osmosis so you do mm -hmm. need someone to kind of give you that information in order to do that um effectively exactly 
Right. And sometimes you need it from someone who's not even part of your family circle. Because if you go to your grandma, your grandparent, your brother, your sister, they have the same training too. And so that's not always effective. Or you grew up in that they're environment. sabotaging it. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or they're sabotaging and they're like, you know, don't be doing that stuff. That's not true. Like, if I go to my grandma, she's going to be like, this head. is Jesus. You don't need, we ain't did no therapy when we was growing up. We, we took that to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> you know, yeah, we were also poor. We didn't go to the doctor either, but I don't think that's right. Well, and the other thing is, <laughs> I feel like your parents or your grandparents can also feel like and take these as a slight. Mm -hmm. If you're like, mom, yes. I don't want to do it that way because that was wrong. And oh, you want me growing? Go be growing right. then. Well, no, or yeah. it's like, well, what you're fine. First of all, I'm, I'm not, not though. That's I'm, why I'm in you therapy. You traumatized me. Right. Oh, oh, oh. Right. Now beating you every day is right. traumatic. <laughs> when I was growing up, that was tough love. Okay, now I socked you in the chest and now you got residual problems. <laughs> that is so true. Yep. So you end up feeling bad and like, okay, I guess I'll do it the way you guys did it. And pass on this on this trauma, even though you want to do better. And so we always right. talk about generational curses in the church. We was passing on some generational curses. Absolutely. Shoot, Absolutely. What you talking. I'll be up in therapy exactly like, ooh, right. get my mama in here too. <laughs> Look what you did to me. <laughs> And that's, but that's the case with a lot of our island people and our black people. That's how, that's how we are. It's like, we don't put your business out there for everybody else and you right. deal with mm -hmm. it on your own. And you know, it worked for you. So it worked, you know, why didn't it work? Right. And a metaphor I actually use for with a grandparent a couple of years ago, because she was raising, it was like a seven year old woman raising a seven year old uh, grandson of hers. And she was doing all these things because she did it with her son who was now in prison. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, why can't I just blank? And I said, well, let me give you an example. Rotary phones worked when I grew up in the 80s, right? That's how we call people. But, and yeah, I can say, well, I, it worked then, yeah. but I can't Facebook, I can't text. People surely ain't gonna reach me if I'm on the road. So just because something worked before, it doesn't mean it's the most effective thing now. It's just mm. not, it's old school, it's, it's outdated and we have to adjust and adapt. <laughs> yeah, that's That's good. such a good analogy. Yep. I actually use the rotary phone. phone. And if you showed that to my kid, he would not know how to dial our phone number. Nope. Oh, right. He nope. would be pressing, he would be pressing mm -hmm. the button. Instead of rolling it. He also it, wouldn't yeah. right. remember Instead our Instead of rolling phone. it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Boy, that was old. Yeah, it was. You didn't call a rotary phone, but you were in trouble. You, <laughs> <laughs> you call a 911. Nine is always all at the back. It is. You gotta go all, yeah. all the way. And you get nervous, you don't, you don't go all the way. Yeah. It ain't gonna click. <laughs> All right, so before we get, um, again, right into the episode, let's take a break here and hear a word from the Love Hour sponsors because they're lit and amazing. All right, we're taking a break uh, with Dr. Ann Louise Lockhart. I hope you are enjoying the episode. She's going to be dropping all types of gems to tell you about another gem that you should have in your wardrobe. It is the foundation to any outfit, and that is your undergarments. Ladies, it is so important that you find the right bra because you don't want back problems and if you don't have back problems then you also want your silhouette to look very nice and flat mm -hmm. and through your uh, clothing and so one of my favorite bras that I've told you guys about over and over and over again is third love third love Melissa loves third love I do love third love one of their number one selling points outside of their signature half sizes outside of the fact that they fi help you find the right size bra that is perfect for you and the shape of your breast. They also have nudes of different nude variety. Mm -hmm. I've said this over and over and over again, but the fact of the matter is that representation matters. Uh -huh. right, Lisa. All right. Uh -huh. So that's why yeah. we are here and why I support Third Love. Third Love. Third Love knows that there's a perfect bra for everyone. So right now they're offering my listeners 15% off your first order. Go to thirdlove.com slash love hour, love hour right now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 15% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash love hour love hour for 15% off today. And we're going to go right back into the show. All right. And we're back. Okay. So let's get to the meat of the matter while we're here, why we are here to talk to Dr. Ann Louise Lockhart. And that is uh, girl, give us all the tips and tricks. 
on how to have these conversations with our Black children and the state that we are in, in the United States of America, where you feel like, I mean, there's still riots going on in Portland, Oregon yes. today. Okay. Yes. Like this is a yes. real life thing that's affecting so many of us. Can, can you just, I'll let you take the floor and just give us some of those um, tips that you recommend. Yes. So, you know, this is going to be so different based on the age of your kids, where you live, who the parents are. There's going to be so many factors, right? But I think the bottom line is we want to make sure that our kids aren't just getting the ugly side of our society mm -hmm. and our history, because that'll scare them. There's a lot right. of kids right now who are afraid of going back outside, not just because of COVID, um, or going back to school, because they have heard of all these shootings and killings and all these different things because of people being Black. So I tell parents that you got to balance the information, that it needs to be where you're talking about celebrating your culture and our history, not the bleached history, the real history, uh -huh. right? The stuff about what was going on, what happened in terms of who we are as a people. So I think a big part of it is celebrating our culture, celebrating who we are, and giving them the real deal about stuff. Like that, you know, for example, Africa is, is a continent, not right. a country, right? right? And that it's not a bunch of people in huts who are poor and homeless. There are major cities and businesses and millionaires there. So even something as simple as that, we've been showing our kids um, YouTube videos, uh, Black Excellence videos. Uh -huh. okay. um, and it's showing all these like Black millionaires and Black um, inventors and you know, all these different, the richest black homes, uh, neighborhoods in America, just things like that, things that celebrate who we are and that our people are doing good stuff. Um, so that's one, a big, big piece of it. Can and I just, the other part of it is, can I pause yeah. you right there really quickly? I think that that is so important. When I think about the conversations that even we've had with our kids, it's trauma first. It's trauma only. It's trauma My only. My son's like, hey, can I go for a walk? Take your phone. Charge your phone. If you are stopped by white people, say, I live here. My parents are down the street. Literally. Can I call my parents? Uh, call the police. Mm -hmm. Do you know the address? What's your phone on charge? Don't leave it till you charge your phone. Be small. Don't be black. You can't <laughs> not be black. Okay. Take your hoodie off. No limits. No boundaries. <laughs> no limit soldiers. Like, he'd be like, you know, and I'll just be in the house then. In real and life. And he's just walking around the neighborhood. He ain't even going outside the gate because mm -hmm. we live in a gated community. Yeah. He ain't even going outside yeah. the gate. Hold on. Before you even say that, though. There's still a fear there, okay? Kevin's in the like, gate. In the gate is still like, okay, so you're in the gate. Do you belong inside the gate? Right. How did you get Because many here? people looking like us in the gate. Exactly. So literally, Isaiah went, wanted to go for a walk. He's been doing these walks where he wants to get out the house. Great. I'm so happy. Get out the house. Go be active. Also, if you get stopped by a Karen, this is the conversation you need to have. Make sure you're smiling. Make sure you're looking at her in your eyes. Take your hands out of your pockets. If you get stopped by the police, ask them, can I pull out my phone? Can I call my parents? Make sure your phone is charged. If things get really bad, use turn your camera on. Literally had this conversation with Isaiah when last week? Mm -hmm. Literally. At no point, and we've had multiple conversations with our kids. At no point have we said, let's talk about and celebrate Black excellence. Let's well, we talk, talk about, about June 19th. Well, I said June 19th. Uh, June, June 19th. 19th. We did a little bit, but even then, it is a celebration, but it's also like In they the didn't want us to be free. <laughs> <laughs> we should have been free, but we weren't. <laughs> So true. And I, I was in, a, I was feeling away around Juneteenth. They, the whole reason we up in Juneteenth, if you understand me, is because they didn't want to let us free when we was free. Two years we had to be slaves. Exactly. Extra. So we going to celebrate. Ain't no 4th of July. The kids was like, can we do fireworks? Ain't no fireworks. Come on, fire on fireworks. Ain't no joy. Yeah. Except Juneteenth. 4th of July is just a date to you now. <laughs> So I love that. I think that that was such, it's so, um, uh, it's a small point, but I think it's such an impactful, important point. If we're going to have yeah. these conversations, let's make sure that we are also including the beautiful the portion of being black and what that means exactly. and what that looks like in back at black excellence. Okay. I'm going to let you finish. Watch right. black is king well, and but, then tell them about black lives matter. <laughs> Balance. But the thing is, what you're doing is important because you need to do that, right? And so, but I think we get so focused, kind of like, you know, when you watch all these movies, 
you know, that are showing about 12 years a slave and Django, like all these things that are showing, it's like, I'm um, sorry, we're, we're more than slaves and maids. Like we, right. we have that, or even having a character that's just happens to be black and is the main person in the movie. Yeah. Yes. That's, you know, it, so it doesn't have to be something that is focused on being black necessarily, but just representative. representative. So, so like I talked to the kids about, um, my kids just yesterday about um, uh, Spider-Man, the multiverse. Oh, you know, yeah. with Miles, oh, Miles Morales, Morales. Being black and Puerto Rican, right? Yeah. I'm like, that was, uh, and it wasn't about him being black. He just no. happened to be a black Spider-Man, right? He had them J's on. So you yeah, knew, right. but it wasn't like, hey, black boy, black boy. Yeah. It was right, like, exactly. you know, he's just black boy. He, he ain't. Exactly. And so I think that the celebration piece and the, the, the beauty of who we are, what we are about is really, really important. Um, but then, you know, then it's the other part then about educating about the basics too. So you know, what is racism? What is stereotypes? What are microaggressions? What's cultural appropriation? Man. Um, why are people racist? Like talking to our kids about that because it, they have a hard time understanding that. Like my son, who's almost eight, he was like, because he's know I've been having these conversations a lot, especially lately. And he asked me the other day, he was like, so mommy, is it fixed? And I said, is it what fixed? And he said, well, you know, you're doing all this racist talk, racism talk. So, you know, and usually if we want to learn something and do better, we learn it, so then we do better. So now that people learn it, and that's his mindset, right? Is that's, that you're, it's- That breaks my like, heart. No, sweetheart, no. not yet, not yet. Because if you learn something, your mind should be woke and open, right. and then you right. do better, right? right? And I was like, yeah. yeah, it's not that simple, unfortunately. It should I think be, it should be that, that simple. We've done that too. A couple months ago, there was a video about systemic racism in cartoon form. Mm -hmm. It was like, yes, this is Jamal. He does this and, and we show that to our kids just so they understand. And the crazy thing is, doctor, we, Melissa and I talked a lot about, we grew up not feeling racism as heavy as this mm -hmm. for our kids. It wasn't something I feel like we had to think about every day. You know, I mm -hmm. think because of the internet and information is shared so quickly. When I was a kid in El Paso, I didn't know much more of the news than, you know, outside of El Paso. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, now police brutality isn't new. It's just because of camera footage and the internet, it seems way more, uh, well, it, it's not seen. It is more in, in, your in your face because of, you know, cameras in, in social media. So we're outside playing. We was just outside. There wasn't as much stuff that we thought about every day, but it's, our kids don't have that luxury. You know, there's, there's right. not that luxury of just innocence and freedom and stuff. And even just with times and stuff mm -hmm. like we played outside and our parents had no idea where we were, or I don't know how you were raised, but right. Same I went as far as my bike Same could here. take me. My mom, I guarantee you, she didn't know how far I really went. I went as far as you could go. And, you know, I just came back before the time. And you didn't think about it. I didn't right. even think about it. And my kids didn't just started leaving the house and walking far this year. We was doing that at six. Mm -hmm. We was walking to school, mm -hmm. you know, there ain't even no school buses in our neighborhood. In LA, mm -hmm. there are no school buses. Mm -hmm. How y'all know I can get them to school? Y'all got to help us. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool, cool. So yeah, I think that we have to educate them about the basic stuff because, mm -hmm. you know, it's something that a lot of adults don't even know, but, right. you know, they have to understand it and we have to understand it ourselves too. And I was just listening to a video. I don't know how old it was, but it was really powerful from Dr. Anita Phillips. She's a black psychologist. Yes, I love her. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. She does I I've never us, seen Sarah this Roberts. particular mm -hmm. video. Yes. And it was about the psychology of cruelty. And she talked mm -hmm. about how in order to be able to treat someone less than, and I was just talking to my kids about this, is that you have to dehumanize them first. And that's, it's not about racism. It's about dehumanization of people. And when you can look at them as less than like animals or just below an animal, like Hitler did with the Jews, yeah, seeing them the as rats, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you can see them as rats, well, yeah, we can gas a rat because they're no big deal. You right. know, if you see uh, African enslaved as, you know, maybe like an ape, then, well, of course we can enslave them because they're just an animal. And so when you can dehumanize a person or a whole group of people, then that's who they are and that's how you keep them oppressed. And that was like literally in the law, three fifths of a man was, yes. was written right. down. Yes. You know what I mean? That was, you know, you, you weren't even considered a man legally. Right. You couldn't own land. So um, I totally agree. With, and you feel like you see a lot of that on social media, how uh, white people can disassociate 
from the fact mm-hmm. that this is a human. Mm-hmm. You know, like you yeah. see a man getting murdered in the street and you say if he had jest. Mm-hmm. Right. You don't even acknowledge that. Right. You know, even if that was, even if the crime were committed, mm-hmm. our law doesn't say if you are guilty of the most heinous crime, you yeah. are killed on the spot. Right, right, right. Right. By the police. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Um, it's innocent until proven guilty. That's yes, what and you can see it a lot in when white shooters or white people kill their family, they're humanized by the media yeah. immediately. Right. Yeah. It's loving father snapped. He was misunderstood. Black people, we don't get the right. family picture. Yeah. There's sometimes a black person victimized by the white person, and they'll put the black person in the mugshot. Right. Yeah. And the white person in the family person, and they're the aggressor mm-hmm. in the crime. Mm-hmm. Like those things are. They're not so subtle, but you it, it frames your mind. Yeah. You know right. what I mean? While we're right. on this point, can you talk to those, um, you know, we have listeners, obviously, that are going to look different than the way that we do. So if you are, you know, a white parent and you're listening to them, to this episode, and you're saying, okay, I hear you. I want to talk to my kids about microaggression and racism and prejudice. How do you have those type of conversations with your kids? What does that look like? So I think first of all, you need to do your own work first and make sure you educate yourself, right? Because if you, or those wrong thoughts, yeah, those wrong thoughts. Because if you up there glaringly racist jokes and making all these inappropriate stereotypical comments, and then you say, okay, to your little kid about don't be prejudiced and racist and all these things, then that's not going to match up for them. So it's about, you got to do your own work and you got to read up the history about what is the legit history. So when people say, you know, I'm like, okay, tell me when I do like intakes with my clients, I said, tell me about your ethnic background. And most white families will say, oh, we're white. I said, where are you from? What's your ethnic background? Because white is a social construct that was created to keep people separate from the free blacks. And so if you realize that your people created that, you got to understand that. You got to realize the history of these things. So I really say, I tell uh, white families and I, I Wait, encourage doctor, them. Wait, can you go back a little bit? Yeah. I, I, I've been taking an Afram class in a while. Frame that again for me. There was, obviously there's enslaved blacks, free blacks, mm-hmm. and the term white came from separating between free blacks and... and it was... Yes, it was a way to create because the races weren't separated like that. It was a way to create a division because when blacks became free and there were free blacks, but some of them were still enslaved blacks, they had to find a way to keep more division. And so a lot of that term white came out as about to be able to keep that separation. going. Got it. Because you had poor whites and in order for them to feel a little bit better than black because they didn't have the monetary status that separated them you just gave, you white. gave them white, white and that was the little step up needed and remember when the scottish and the irish came over they weren't seen very highly by the other yeah right europeans yeah. they were the lower class whites right irish yeah for and sure. so so i think that's where so you white was even above to, irish exactly right got it exactly that's what politicians we, have done for a long time they've uh, they've gotten totally. poor white people to vote against their self-interest in the sure. interest of at least being white, sure. even though it's not going to benefit you. Right. They'll vote right. like that. Exactly. But yeah. we don't get this history, right? We don't right. get this history. And so I think we need to make sure that you get history, not just from the perspective of the oppress- oppressor. It has to be from different perspectives because then you can't teach your kid about these things. When they ask you about, well, why do black people feel unsafe around police. Well, remember there was a slave patrol and people don't know that. Slave patrol was the original uh, uh, force that brought back runaway slaves to the master and then beat them or helped them to be punished. And so that's that generational trauma again, right? So when people say, oh, just get over it. Slavery was so long ago. Well, no, it's not. This is something that changes our DNA. It's something that we're ingrained with. And so as a white parent, we have to educate ourselves, even as black parents, many black people don't know a lot of this history either, because how would we, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about doing the work, getting that information, understanding what it means to be racist, what does it mean to be prejudiced? You know, how are you appropriating cultures rather than celebrating? And understand that. I also want to point out, I'm sorry, I want to point out, sometimes we feel bad because we didn't know stuff. Mm -hmm. 
And now as I'm realizing, it's not, we shouldn't feel bad. This history is intentionally withheld from oh, us absolutely. Oh, in yeah. school. Like this Wilmington thing, I've been talking about it a lot. I saw it on Tony's page. Well, I've been in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898, mm -hmm. uh, where they destroyed the black newspaper and, and you know, they, they had a coup. He, people in Wilmington didn't even know about wow. that. So out mm -hmm. there's 1985, the city of Philadelphia police department bombed uh, black people. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about that. Mm -hmm. People on the internet are like, how would you not know? Like, how would I know? Right. I've how been to Philadelphia you? like mm -hmm. three times. It wasn't taught in my, in high school in U S history. Mm -hmm. It wasn't taught in college. That's not common. Black wall street. I didn't know about that until we had a show. Actually, I crazy enough. I heard the game. The rapper, the game mm -hmm. was always talking about black wall Got street. It. So I researched it and then we had a show in Tulsa. And then I really like, Oh yeah. we went to a museum and, and the curator literally talked to me, Tony, and Tahir, and Jay for like an hour and a half about it. Mm -hmm. Literally walked us through what happened. And then the Watchmen series happened. So two of my instances were from the media. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So um, they always talk about this. Texas makes a lot of the school books. And they're like, nope, right. we're not going to talk about slavery like that. And mm -hmm. then what are you, how are you supposed to know? Right. 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 Because it doesn't want, you know, the majority culture to look bad because all the stuff that's happened that has been oppressive have been perpetrated by them. Man, so, I just read an article. I'm sorry, I've been interrupting you a lot, but you are like literally <laughs> opening my mind. <laughs> there was a Manhattan Beach, black people, Manhattan Beach is here in LA. Um, yes. And black people owned a piece of the beach. They had this beautiful hotels and restaurants and all this stuff. It's called Bruce's, Bruce's Beach. And basically white people were like, no, uh -huh. right? They had put parking signs out, said you can't park if you're out of town. And then they basically eradicated all the black people and then yeah. felt bad about it maybe five, 10 years ago. And when they rewrote history, the person who started to kick black people out, they're like, this is the guy who let black people in. Uh, like he let them in, but then kicked them yeah, out, but right. they left out that sure, part. Sure. And now the, the doggone oppressor is the one who the hero. looks, yeah, he's he like the hero. Mm -hmm. right. And, and ugh. yeah, before we move on, let's take a break right here. All right, we're gonna take a break from the show right now, but you should never take a break from great headphones in your life. Listen, whether you're working from home, on your fitness or whatever, you wanna listen to what's in your ears and not the sounds of the world, not your kids, not your neighbors, not your trainer telling you one more. I didn't hear you say one more push up. I'm done. <laughs> and in order to do that, you need a great pair of wireless earbuds and that comes from Raycon. Listen, I have these Raycon earbuds they are amazing i got my kids a pair because they deserve high quality sound but i don't want to have to pay the price for high quality earbuds so with raycon i get the quality sound i desire but my wallet thanks me a little bit more each day raycon earbuds start about the half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds and they sound just as amazing as other top audio brands you know the newest model the everyday e25 earbuds are their best ones yet with six hours of playtime seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit. Plus, the company was co-founded by Ray J and celebrities like Snoop, Brandy, and J.R. Smith all back it as well. Now you listen this. Now's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash love hour. That's buyraycon.com slash love hour. Love hour. Buyraycon.com slash love Love hour. Love hour. For 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. Tell them Kevin Liz sent you. All right. Now we're going to tell you about native. Listen, we know you're in the house, but just because you're in the house, that don't mean you can't be putting on deodorant and smelling good. And don't smelling be fresh. musty and locked up. You know what um, Big Boy and Andre 3000 said? What? You got to be so fresh and so Ain't clean. nobody dope as me. I'm just so fresh and so clean fresh with native, native, clean, native. Clean. Okay, I'm here for it. I'm here for the remix <laughs> with the native version. You know we love native. You guys know that my favorite scent is their coconut vanilla uh, scent. They also have lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, and citrus and herbal, but quite literally anything with vanilla, I'm down for. It's like 
quite literally my favorite it scent. Literally, she's not lying when no. she says quite literally. It, it is her favorite scent. It is my favorite scent. And Native is so fantastic because they also just started a newsletter. And guess what's included in newsletters, y'all? What is it, baby girl? Updates. Updates. When things go on sale. Mm. And sometimes the inside scoop on discount code. What you talking? Mm-hmm. These are all the things that I love and the reason why I don't mind receiving emails in the mail that say, listen, girl, you want to take advantage of this here 30% off, okay? Uh, do what I did and make the switch to Native today by going to nativedeo.com slash love hour. Love hour. Use promo code love hour at checkoff and get 20% off your first order. That's Native deo.com slash love hour love hour or use our promo code love hour at checkout for 20 percent off your first order okay all right so we are back before we go too far down into the actual history i want to make sure we um continue to talk about having these conversations with our kids so when yes. you are um the i think the education piece i think that's kind of what kevin is, uh, is getting at is that even as black parents, we have a responsibility of educating ourselves with the history so that way we can pass on an accurate representation of our history and not um, this whitewash, bleach, revisionist history that's been served mm-hmm. to us. I think that was kind of your point there. Yes, exactly. And I think that's where, as even as white parents, to do that work so that they understand what the true history is. They can educate their kids and actually advocate for their schools to represent it correctly in their history books because Mm -hmm. it's not correct. And so, but then also being able to have things like toys, books, movies, artwork, um, things that represent different cultures in your home. Because I have white clients now who I'm like the first black person they've really ever interacted with. They don't have black friends. They don't have black neighbors. They go to predominantly white school. They don't have black. I mean, there's, there's nothing that shows anything that, you know, celebrates black culture, except what they see in the media. So I think we also have to make sure that, you know, as a white family, as a Mexican family, as whatever else besides black to represent those things in your home with toys, books, all those different kinds of things for your kids as well. So, so one good. way to do that, a friend of mine has a thing, and I'm actually uh, was going to get this for my kids. It's called Because of Them We Can. Uh, and the website is becauseofthemwecan.com. And it's a, it's a month. You, f- you familiar with it? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> uh, monthly subscription box. And it tells you about black history outside, you know, of course, Martin Luther King and these people, but other black history, there's toys, there's clothes, there's all this stuff unique who created culture tags. This is her other business. Mm. Um, and it teaches your kids and they have different ones for like, if your kids are under five or under seven mm. or up to 12 or 13, I think it stops at like 12 or 13. And it's a great way to understand uh, black history in a practical way. And I think also one thing we have to understand is Black people are, you, you were talking about the media. There's what you see on the media, black yeah. people are criminals, but then you also see black excellence. Mm-hmm. And a lot of yes. times the average black person is compared to the Obamas, the LeBrons, yes. and the Beyonce's. And it's like, well, why can't you do that? That's literally 20 black people right, right, right. in the world. You're comparing yeah. all the black people to the people who have excelled the most at their field, mm-hmm. President of the United States you know, basketball players. And that's also harmful mm-hmm. because it's, mm-hmm. it shows you if, if you're, if you're LeBron, look what LeBron James can do. Right. Why can't you do that? And even right. like, why can't you that was it? one of the criticisms of the Cosby show. And I, I'm glad the Cosby show was it, but it was like, that ain't average black family. But before that, it was all struggle. It was all good times. Right. And, but yeah. there were black doctors and lawyers, the same thing with the Fresh Prince, like black people are not a, not a monolith. Some black people, you know, like pumpkin pie. Maybe they don't know about Anita Baker initially, but find out about her later. <laughs> we can't be upset at them. It's not their fault. That's anti-black. My, my <laughs> husband didn't know about Anita Baker. He did it. My husband didn't know about Anita Baker. No, he did not. That was great. <laughs> that was great. Man. So I, those were really great resources. The resource again was... Because, uh, because of, of them, them we can. Can. Dot com. I'm actually... Um, I was going to, I'm actually going to sign up. I was, I was thinking about it. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to sign up today. And this is, this is no, like, she's my friend, but this is, she didn't ask us to do this. It's actually an amazing box. And you could see previous months boxes and things like that. It's a great way. And honestly, guys, I was looking through some of the boxes. I was like, 
I did, I did not know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, I, C.T. Think, Vivian, when he passed away, mm-hmm. I had not heard of C.T. Vivian. Right. I'd heard of John Lewis. Yeah. But I didn't. And I was kind of ashamed to say that, you know, because I know a lot of black history, but I, I was not familiar with C.T. Viv- yeah. Vivian. So I had to mm-hmm. I, I had to learn. Yeah. Well, the the I think the education piece is um, the biggest thing, because I think a lot of us have a hard time having the conversations ourselves because we don't really know where to start. Like we right. don't have we're not armed with the our information to have the conversation to begin with, whether we're white or we're black, even when we're talking just as adult with um, educating, you know, if you have a white friend and you are willing to do the work and you want to be that advocate, that safe space for them to come to you and say, hey, girl, I have a question. Like, can you help me with this? A lot of times we don't have those answers either. Girl, like, I'm not an educator. Like, I don't know what to say. And so it is important for us to also have that same education. So as we're going back and we're talking to our um, kids, how do you explain, let's say, microaggression and stereotype? I, I know it's like age appropriate conversations, but how do you have, how do you explain this? Because my son, similar to yours, was like, this isn't fair. It's not fair for mm-hmm. someone to judge me based on something I didn't even do. It's not fair. This doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. So how do I frame these conversations in a way that like can make sense to a young yes. child? That's a great question. I've been doing a lot of these um, workshops even more so now because people are like trying to scramble and do what they should have been doing. Yes. And so um, I have, I've created in the world, all the workshops, I've created these small little snippet scripts for parents to tell their kids because um, kids don't need a bunch of words and Mm -hmm. they don't need a bunch of really abstract stuff. They need stuff that's really concrete, right? So I always tell people that when you're going to talk to your kids about it, you should come from a place of um, empathic understanding. So really saying, if they say, oh, I'm really scared. Yeah, of course you're scared because this is a scary time. That would be an empathic response, right? Got it. So not saying, oh, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. That's, that's dismissive, <laughs> right? It. So if they say something like, I'm going to pull it up right here. So one of the quotes that I have is like, if someone asks about the police, your kids ask about the police. Mm-hmm. Well, but the police is supposed to protect us. And one of the ways that I've framed it is like, yeah, you're right. The police are here to protect and to serve, but that hasn't been everybody's experience. Mm, I so like when that. you're, when you're responding to your kid, we're not saying to bad mouth anybody. We don't need to judge. We don't need to criticize because what we remember our kid soaks up what we give them, right? They pick up on us they They mirror us. So if we come at it with this big, um, uh, lots of judginess, a lot of criticism, although the situation is unfair, that's what they're, that's the language they're going to adopt. So even something like if you have a racist uncle, right? You have somebody who, uh, a racist friend, and you could be like, yeah, you know what? We don't even know who they are. We're going to disown them in a minute. Like that, that would be judgy, even though it would, might be like what you want to say. But you could say, you know what? Yes, uncle so-and-so made a very inappropriate statement. We don't talk like that in this family. That's good. Mm. That's right? good. So when you talk to them about that stuff, it's about really coming from a place of empathic understanding, but also then being able to give information that's responsive, but not, doesn't escalate the situation. It just talks to them about it so that they can ask more questions and they can feel like they can talk more about it. So then even things like microaggressions, you know, you can talk to them about, you know, microaggressions are when people make assumptions about you and they use statements and they're often things that we don't even realize Mm -hmm. they're saying like, wow, you're real pretty for a dark skinned black girl. Yeah. Or, wow, you're tall and you don't play basketball? Mm-hmm. Like, it may seem harmless, but those are snubs. Those are little slights against you because, again, you don't fit the stereotype and you're the exception to the rule. You're Black and you got into Yale? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> those are microaggressive statements. I love the way you just explained it because it cemented that... <laughs> Listen, it cemented what it is to me. I had a whole different, it was a, a little bit more um, convoluted me and too. complicated. It's so simple. But, yeah. yeah, but what you're basically saying is when something is rooted in a stereotype and you seem to Pretty be much. the exception or the opposite of that, that's where that statement is stemmed from. You're, you're evaluating. Many times it is. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. That's good. Yeah. I really, that you're was. You're evaluating their value or the way they show up you know, or like, wow, you know, I didn't know blank. You're Asian and you're not good at math. Like Mm. that seems like it's a 
you know, like a statement or it could even sound like a compliment. Compliment. Right? Your hair, even, even like, like look, a I see how it's like your hair is so pretty. Let me touch it. Is it real? Yeah. Yes. Right. That right. comes from a black girls can't have pretty hair if it's not right. weave. Exactly. Even the idea of pretty hair. Oh, girl, you got pretty hair is that's yeah. rooted is, in good yeah, hair. Good hair. Yeah. That's rooted in this, the idea that we can't have, you know, whatever. And really pretty hair is very European. Is it straight? Exactly. Yeah. Is it, yeah. It's, it's the standard, it's right? Spike. We're judging it based on the standard, the white standard. So the, the closer standard. your hair is to the white standard, Correct. then the prettier you are. So your Correct. features, your skin color, your hair. The and crazy thing example, about that is the stuff uh -huh. white women do to become pretty is mostly to look like black women. Yes. Right. Lip fillers, darkening skin, um, butt hair. implants. Sure. It's like mm -hmm. the stuff that they get on. Michaela Cole, who wrote um, I May Destroy You, mm -hmm. Um, I saw this picture of like what the Kardashians are trying to look like is Michaela uh -huh. Cole's natural features. Oh wow! You can see her her cheekbones, her, everything about her natural disposition. It's what they um, and a lot of people's mm. um, uh, plastic surgery and makeup. It's what they tried to look like. Wow. But people were saying on her, you say it's not attractive. Mm -hmm. But then people try and go and get it, and it right. is attractive. Right. That happens to black women all the Absolutely. all the time. And that's also, where you're moving say, into cultural appropriation. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, take a break right here and hear for one of our sponsors. All right, last but not least, listen, Skillshare, y'all are friends of the podcast, okay? I need y'all to know this. Why? Because you be teaching us, you be teaching, you be <laughs> teaching us all of the things you guys know all as of, of late i have been really on a kick of taking my brand more seriously you have. i have and skillshare offers tons of classes on branding and posting and instagram and just all types of resources that i find to be extremely valuable in this season that i'm in because there's no time like the present time there's no time like quarantine to take the business that you've done on the side the hobby that you've done on the side just a little bit more seriously to bring in some additional streams of income when a lot of us are at home and maybe not working our full 40 hour schedule so why not do that so explore your creativity and not just your creativity i mean it, literally there's creativity on skillshare but there's a lot of practical things on skillshare as where and i always just recently as in always have said that creativity needs to be grounded in something practical you need yeah. to learn something in order to put where, where, uh, uh, legs to that creativity. So you can get two months free of premium membership at Skillshare.com slash love hour. That's hour. two whole months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. Get started and join today by heading to Skillshare.com slash love hour. That's two free months of unlimited access to thousands of classes at Skillshare.com slash love hour. Listen, there's no time like the present time. Turn that hobby into your main job. Go do do it, learn about it, take it seriously. And now let's get back to hearing all the things that Dr. Ann Louise Lockhart got to tell us. Yeah. Okay, and we are back. I actually thought that was really good um, modeling. I think modeling is mm -hmm. one of the best ways for me to kind of clumsily fumble through my way of parenthood. So do you have any other um, examples that you can give us that we can model in these conversations with our kids? Yeah, I think cultural appropriation is a big one because okay. I get a lot of questions like that. I just had a workshop last week talking about how to raise anti-racist kids. And one of the parents asked about, uh, my daughter wants to dress as Moana and she's white. Is that okay? Mm. Because we talked about what cultural appropriation or misappropriation is. And it's basically when the majority culture, white people in this case in America, um, look at something as less than that black people, for example, are doing. And so Bantu knots, right? So, right? Say for example, wearing Bantu knots, most black women cannot wear that in a professional setting. It's seen as unprofessional hair, right? right. But right. yet Mark Jacobs, I believe it was, during his uh, New York Fashion sure Week did. show, had a bunch of white models with, and he named it something different, spring knots or something. Oh, they like love to switch the name up. They, they loved it and people loved it. Oh my gosh, it's so high fashion. Kim Kardashian even had some cornrows in and yep. uh, you know, on the runway. And that they was called like, her oh, boxer so braids. Fashion. Yeah. Right. Right. But black women, not even in the military until recently, could wear their hair in locks or braids because, it, again, it wasn't seen as professional. So the misappropriation piece comes in when the group can't wear a style, clothing, whatever, because it's seen as inappropriate, unprofessional. 
but yet the dominant culture hijacks it and then takes it on and then renames it as, as exotic, high fashion, trendy, mm. that kind of stuff. And that's cultural appropriation. So you're ta- people do that with the Native American culture all the time. I mean, look at all the NFL and baseball teams, right? right. The Redskins, the Indians, like that is offensive. Um, and so, but yet we take it and we, t- and we say, oh, I'm going to use this as a icon or as a symbolism or as an image, but yet you look at the Native American people as savages, as less than, let's put right. them on a reservation and exterminate them. So we're not, we don't even value these people, but let's name all our teams after them, right? And so when and we look like, at that, we have like to they think like they're paying attention. homage. Yeah. I've seen that a lot not. with a lot of the teams. When the Redskins' name was dr- yeah, uh, changed, not. they were like, you know, people are like, okay, the Braves, the Chiefs, y'all are next. And they're like, no, we're paying homage. Mm-hmm. And uh, also, no. Also, no. No, no. you're not. No, you're not. Um, no, you're not. I, dang, I went for, go ahead. I forgot what I was going to say now. So I think those are, oh, I know what to I was talk to say. our kids about that. Yeah, go ahead. One of the prime examples of that, I don't know if you remember, it was one of the big conversations was happening about the border. Kids were locked in cages and a lot of the politicians who were on that, they were at a Mexican restaurant. They had some barrels on eating Mexican food and they didn't even see oh, the irony. That's funny. In being on television saying, go back to Mexico, go back to your country, lock them up but we will indulge in your food. You know, that happens yeah. to black people all the time. It's like, we'll take your art, your dances, your, your slang, you know, your culture. We just don't want you, the, the person right. we don't like. But uh, <laughs> we just did the ad, Josh. <laughs> I thought you were being I funny. I thought you were joking. That's why we were so laughing. Did I. <laughs> Sorry, we're having a moment. Josh is telling us to do the ad. We Josh just did keeps the ad. us on track to do an ad. So he keeps holding up the first time he did it, like right after we did the ad. So we just laughed, but he just did it again. <laughs> so we realized he was being serious. Anyway, go ahead. No, I, I, I'm actually, I was just thinking like, have I done any cultural appropriation? I don't think so. Yeah, I hope I don't, not. I, I also think. Oh, there's that, some terms. There's some terms, uh, Indian giver. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, bottom of the totem pole, yeah. things like that, that I'm, I've had right. to unlearn. I haven't said Indian giver, but I, we'd said that. The crazy thing about Indian giver, you talk about giving something and taking it back. Yeah, right. That's a white giver. Right, right, right. White right. people are the ones who gave stuff and take it. How y'all gonna yeah, put yeah. Indian giver on that name? Y'all are the ones who said, here's this land, Never mind. we want that back. Y'all never go mind. somewhere else. How we, how did that even that's white history erasing the truth? Y'all was the ones and you're gonna put it on the native people. White giver. Mm-hmm. White giver. <laughs> and the bottom of the totem pole actually has doesn't have a negative connotation. That's why it's uh uh that's why you shouldn't use that term. I don't know the exact reason why not not misappropriation or cultural appropriation, but anyway, it has a negative connotation when you say bottom of the totem pole, but right. and then the actual totem pole. The bottom doesn't isn't there's nothing negative about that. Right. We actually looked that up right. on another episode right. a couple weeks ago. What am I doing? Well, that's why there's Gypsy, a really... <laughs> Gypsy's another one too. G- that is another one, right? Yeah, that's right. And the, the thing is that there's a really fine line between cultural celebration and cultural appropriation, right? right. Because people have attacked. I think uh, it was Beyonce that had um, she was uh, some video or performance where she was dressed in Asian some Japanese or Chinese something, um, a, a costume or look. And was people are like, well, is that appropriation? Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't remember who it was, but it was- I feel like I remember this. You remember that? And mm-hmm. I can't remember exactly who it was, um, but it's that, you know, like, well, is that appropriation? Well, it's like, again, it's like, why are you doing this? Is this something that's celebrating? Or is that something that is um, basically taking it and being able to say that, hey, this is part of my culture or, but again, <laughs> it's from, sorry about that. It's from the previous, um, the other culture that is not seen as good enough to represent, but yet I'm going to take it on. Right. Mm. Right. So, right. 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 Um, one other question that I had, um, there was a modeling that you did. Oh, how, okay. Can you frame to us or model for us? I'm sitting down with my child. How, like from start to finish ish. Um, how we have this conversation about what's going on in America, what it means, and balancing that with um, the idea of celebrating Black excellence and not trying, like do all the, the, give us like one concise, <laughs> try to do these things. These are the points. Can you come to my house and just talk to my that's kids? That's really Let's what just I'm asking you. Cut out the middle, man. <laughs> 
Jay, Zane, Joe, get up on this Zoom and just listen to her because we can't, we're not going to remember everything she said. No <laughs> lie. For real, though. This is the fact. Because the way you say it, it just be smooth as butter. And I'm going to be over here, kid. When you're black, you're, uh, the police protect and uh, you got Celebrate served. Us. You got served. Amarion, uh, he had braids. A boxer braids is Kim Kardashian, but boxers, uh, Native American. Uh, Indian giver, <laughs> I'ma just be spouting out all the I'ma be all over. They will be like, "What did you say?" What are you talking about? Right. Protect, protect and serve. But ice cream has a soft serve is yogurt. <laughs> okay, and police eat ice cream. Huh? Okay, <laughs> tell us, model this for us. Okay, so what you would probably say is, um, there are a lot of things about our culture that we love and that we can celebrate and we can learn those together because a lot of what you're learning in school is not accurate. And so let's talk more about where our people come from and where our, um, uh, how we can celebrate those things through our, the way we speak, the way we dress, the music we listen to. Let's talk about how we can celebrate that. So you kind of walk them through that process. Okay. And then you can um, then also in another time, talk to them about, you know, there are things that you need to be aware of in our society, because although there's many things that we love about our culture, not everybody feels the same way. Mm -hmm. And so there are mm -hmm. things like racism and stereotypes, microaggressions, cultural appropriation. Let's talk about what those things mean and then talk about those things. And then another time you can talk about, you know, in our history, there's been things that have happened to us based on what we talked about before with the racism and oppression and cruelty. Mm -hmm. That's because there were groups of people who thought they were better than other people. That's what racism is. And because of that, our people were enslaved. We weren't slaves, we were enslaved. And the reason why those terms are, are important to note is because that was not our identity. That's what was done to us. That's mm. so good. I've been hearing a, that term use yes. more maybe the last year yes. or two and i never knew exactly why and the i feel like that, yeah that that ex yep. that is so true we were slaves right. we weren't slaves we were enslaved, no, we were enslaved. We were enslaved. that's yes. good enslaved. that is really important distinction yes and so then talking about what that is and that's when you can get into some of the ugliness of the history because you've already celebrated it you've defined it and now you're talking about some of the ugly parts of it the police brutality the um what happened in Tulsa, all these different places, you can talk about some of those things and then even give it context. So this is why black people may feel a certain way about police. This is why some black women and black girls may not feel good about when a, a black man dates a white girl. Let me tell you about the history as to what happens when black men and white women interact. Mm -hmm. And there's a history behind that. And so explaining those things, not that it's wrong, but saying this is why, this is why it's an issue for our, for our, our people. Um, and then, then after you do the celebration, the education, then you can talk about some of that ugliness piece of it. But again, you gotta be careful about their, their age because if they're very young, that can be very traumatizing for them to hear right. too much of it, right? If you talk about every single oppressive thing that's ever happened in the media and in history, that yeah, they're never gonna want to go outside of her again. So we want to make sure we're not bombarding them with too much information. Yeah. And then you talk about the everyday safety stuff like you guys are talking about, you know, with your phone, no hoodie, you know, this is the 911, what's your address? So I think that's where for me that's the progression it would take. I what? I was just going to say that if you bucketed those, that's what I thought was really good. Cause if you bucket what you said, it's celebrate first. Mm -hmm. define yes exemplify like provide those examples mm -hmm. and then make sure that they're protected mm -hmm. right those were like exactly. the, the, the big buckets that you said i i like that those are the things i can take with me yeah it's kind of like the um the national music museum of african-american history and culture yeah. like mm -hmm. yes. the bottom level is the part that we have to define in this but also when you go up you have right. Prince and, and Oprah and, and Obama. And when we were there, I remember, I mean, our kids were very young. And they just Not wanted interested. to see Dr. Strange. Um, but to see where we started as enslaved people, and at the time we went there, Obama was still president, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, that is a, 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 a story of triumph. Right. You know, and it's, and, uh, and it's, a great, it's a great story. And I think we, 
you know, it's also about having a good relationship with your kids on a day to day basis right. to where it right. doesn't feel like, cause when we had this conversation with our kids, they were like, okay, this is yeah. unusual because our house is usually filled with laughter and joy and games and blah, blah, blah. Um, I also, do you think traveling can help um, as well to show, you know, cause we've traveled a lot. We show our kids different black people all across the world, you know, in the Caribbean, things like that. I feel like giving them a better worldview. Like there's black people in Spain who speak fluent Spanish and in -hmm. France who speak, you know, you know, or black Dutch people. We were in Amsterdam. We were like, there are a lot of black people here, Mm -hmm. Dutch Mm -hmm. black people, Mm -hmm. not just, you know, tourists. And that was important for our kids. We want to also take them to um, some countries in Africa. One of the girls who used to uh, babysit them is actually from Kenya. And she, prior to pandemic, she was like, Hey, y'all can come Mm -hmm. visit me in Kenya. We actually had plans Mm -hmm. to do it, but COVID, Shoot, American people, we can't even go to Olive Garden. Can't, can't go nowhere. Forget yeah. Italy. We can't even, you can't even order the tour of Italy right now. Right. You just get the bread and the soup. Um, uh, somebody asked a question in the Patreon. That I think Wait, you asked her a question. I don't know. I'm but, so. Yeah, traveling, traveling, traveling and going to different ethnic events, cultural events, restaurants that are authentic. Those I think are important because, you know, P.F. Chang's, although it could be Chinese influence, that's not a Chinese restaurant. Right. But going to authentic stuff so they can get a real, Feel and going to Chinatown and going to different little Italy, like places that also represent different cultures. And then, yeah, traveling, definitely. And having friends that are different than you. Yeah. We, I remember we went to Japan and we ate Japanese sushi. And up until then, our kids have just like, our youngest son thought he liked sushi because he was like eating grocery store sushi. California rolls. California rolls. So, so when I he had sashimi, he was like, now what is this? Because yeah. I'm not, this is not from Ralph's you know it's usually like (laughs) so we had to tell them it's crazy we've done this without really thinking about it Mm -hmm. we're just like hey this ain't really this and we um it was cool because when we were in Japan my son actually found the Google Translate app and because one of the restaurants uh, was only in Japanese the uh menu was in Japanese and the lady spoke a little bit of English but not a huge amount so he like used his phone to translate and then he was like oh I want you know he could at least point to it and but boy when i tell you they were bored <laughs> you know we saw these japanese temples they were like bruh don't nobody care <laughs> but hopefully they'll still remember that you know stuff uh i, I keep forgetting i just want to go ahead uh i want to apologize i've talked over you a lot but it's mostly because i'm so excited and i've been doing good for months but you don't gotta apologize totally i'm used to it i love it I you gotta say so it for the bad. commenters but the commenters been on me they said you i'm over talking to the doctor you guys are completely right I'm, we haven't had anybody to talk to this, uh, yeah. talk with this to about this things. So <laughs> I'll forgive my passion and cutting off from a place of excitement to talk to someone, an expert about this and don't take it as, I think I know more, I'm trying to learn more. But someone said, what age yeah. should you talk yeah. to yeah. your kids about this? Um, at what age should you bring it up? Um, really, I mean, bring it up as, young as three or four. I mean, I, and and again, but it, but not like, well, let me tell you about what happened to the natives on the reservation. Like, no, right. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Like the kids as young as six months of age actually notice racial differences. Really? Yes. Oh, that doll um, thing we learned about in, uh, in college. Oh, right, 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 right. They were six months. No, no, no. I'm just thinking Uh, that that's, I know it was six months. That was younger than I noticed. Yeah. Yes, wow. they notice some some Six research months. even says three months because of the way they notice when someone looks different than their primary caregiver. And then by age three, they start to comment on them in some way. And then if they don't have intervention properly from their parents or they're not they're around racism and stereotypes and they're not educated by age four, they can be really what looks like racial bias and racial stereotypes. What's so interesting? We have. My God! Mm-hmm. What's yeah. interesting so I, about that is my niece just uh, she's I three. What I thought she just said she was talking about something and she said white and we were all like, okay, yes, but yeah. of course for children it doesn't have the um, connotation. The connotation. Nope. Uh, they're talking strictly skin color. Exactly. This is black lowercase b because yeah, yeah, you're just yeah, yeah. talking about your skin color. White, mm-hmm. although white isn't that's always lowercase but the point is they're just talking about skin color okay exactly. i don't want to get too deep exactly. in this no, conversation that, and you know as you mentioned that i used to work in uh daycare is actually my favorite job of all time um i noticed now that you say it i remember when a if a black because there was a um, chinese girl and her parents were white and the kids would be like what is up yeah because yeah, yeah. y'all don't look like her 
or when there's a couple black kids who are adopted by white people and yeah. whenever they're uh one parent was black and one parent was white and when the white parent came in the kids would be like that's your dad yeah. you know you know but when the black parent <laughs> came in they didn't us. they didn't even notice but it didn't click that um that was happening sure. right i mm -hmm. just um that is crazy because yeah. i remember when yeah, they was, noticed. yeah that's so yep. what does that conversation look like at that age and so, is it a celebratory conversation well it's just a noticing conversation it's uh, noticing so uh, like with my kids when they were like three four they called uh, all white people peach because they're like mommy they're not they're they, like this is white and like white crayon they're like they're peach so that was there like yeah you noticed that she's peach and you look like cinnamon and you look like nutmeg and yet mommy yeah you look like this you look like tea with milk like you know being able to use yeah. foods and right. metaphors and just observe and notice and even like my son when he was four he had this little crush on this girl who he said looked just like me we went to a birthday party and i was trying to locate her and her family and i'm picturing this brown girl and when i saw her she's this very fair-skinned freckled strawberry blonde girl and i'm like no what that is the girl he's like yeah she looked just like you mommy and i'm like okay <laughs> what, what are you noticing right and the parents thought it was so hilarious because when we talked about it he goes yeah mommy she's peach and you're brown but you're both pretty that was what oh. looked like you so he was associating prettiness with european whiteness and we gotta break the structures no. of the mind <laughs> so he knows that ebony brown skinned girl is <laughs> in the world <laughs> <laughs> I thought that though, but that makes so That's much sense. Sweet. He's just associating mm -hmm. beauty right. with with her and you Got and it. me, right? And then we talked about it. And did I you said, correct you know, him what... though and tell him that black is beautiful? <laughs> only, only black. <laughs> I said, well, Noah, what I'm noticing is that she has red hair, and mommy has brown hair, and she has peach skin, and mommy has brown skin. He goes, yeah, mommy, I know, but you're both pretty, and I like her. <laughs> and so for him, <laughs> you know, he was just noticing that it wasn't. He wasn't noticing necessarily that the col the color, yeah, he know that knew the color was sure, different. Right. And so it's just for this age, three, four, five, it's just noticing the color, noticing that even if they make a statement that seems like horrific, like you're like, oh no, that person's black, they're ugly. And instead of being horrified by that, just say, oh, you notice that person's color is different. Let's talk about what makes them different than you, you, you for example. So you, you don't need what? to like blast them. Damn. Right, so that's much. good. That's good because also it's cementing that uh, I feel like, especially if you are um, white and this is, it might be the equivalent of mansplaining as a black person, but I'm going to attempt um, that you almost feel like simply recognizing the differences makes you a racist. So yeah, you no. hear statements like, I don't see skin color. Well, no girl, well that's stupid because that ain't true. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of saying, no, recognize these differences, celebrate these differences. This is okay. That's not what's wrong. It's when mm -hmm. you associate the skin with something less than when you would uh, exactly. treat this, the, because of the skin, you treat them differently. That's what's wrong. But simply saying, or your child simply recognizing that my skin is black and yours is white. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And the, really the biggest part pushback I get from that in terms of talking to our kids about race is people say, well, kids are colorblind or they're, they're innocent or naive. No, they're not colorblind. And actually that is a uh, microaggression because in order to be able to say, I want to choose to be colorblind, that means you're coming from a place of privilege, that you're in a place that you can actually choose to be colorblind because I walk around and people know that I'm black. So the fact that you don't have to, that's privilege. That is, I've never heard it put so eloquently. I've said this many times without saying it that that's way. That's what I'm saying. You, you have the, I, we were saying this about uh, Trump and, Kill, and Hillary, right? Or politicians. A lot of times people are like, well, I don't, I'm, I'm not voting on race. Like you get the luxury of not having to worry about what stop and frisk means for you, right? Stop and frisk doesn't affect you. So you don't have to right. vote for that. You don't have it, to it has a really negative impact for us. And to have that ability to say, doesn't matter to me if you're white, yellow, purple, gray. Okay, well, nobody <laughs> is that. But the people who are black are treated differently in the medical field, in the housing field. And I, man, I was just watching a video on Twitter the other day about how Listen, I don't want to go too far into it, but essentially um, one of the reasons black women have such difficulty in the medical field is because doctors don't believe they feel pain the yep. same way. 
So when they yep. say they feel yep. pain, they think, oh, you can take it. It's probably not really pain. Mm -hmm. So they have something way harsher happening and it's not, mm -hmm. it's not being uh, attributed. Right. That's it, man. There's a, it, right. it's just a lot. That's, there's that's a, the dehumanization, Kevin, though. Yeah. That's the dehumanization that black women are less than, and they can tolerate it because they're not really the same as our white women. That that's wow. the dehumanization. The delicate white flower. Feminism so much being associated of, the, with whiteness. of whiteness, you exactly. know, and, and that's the thing about racism. It's not just calling you a nigga, right? It's you not being shown houses in a neighborhood where the real estate agent doesn't think you can afford it. Right. It's things like that where you don't even have a, you don't even know things exist. Sure. It's your yeah. name. You're not even having a chance at a job because your name sounds black. Mm -hmm. It's stuff like that that you can't even change. This is my mom saying, yeah. I named you Kevin Allen so you could have a chance at a job, right. not like something that sounded black because I didn't want your resume to, st to stop you. It shouldn't be like that. Right. But it's also the daycare and school systems that white kids and black kids who do the same behavior, the black and Mexican kids are more likely to be expelled and written up than the white kids for the exact same behavior. 100%. That's why it's not colorblindness because we are, doesn't mean that there's a bunch of racist teachers walking around. It means that we view black people, Hispanic people, Mexican people, Puerto Rican people, we view them differently because they don't follow the standard. So you good. know what's crazy? Joe Kennedy mm -hmm. was a doggone drug dealer, mm -hmm. bootlegger smuggler, mm -hmm. and his children, his son became president or right. grandson, whatever, some down the, almost all their children are politicians. Right. The children of Frank Lucas and, um, you know, all these, we don't have that. No. And even Jay-Z uh, these days can't even get a benefit of being yeah. who he is today. He's always associated with it's being a not drug the dealer. Same. That's it. Doggone mob culture. Yeah. We love mob, mob movies. We don't love, yeah. we don't love Snowfall. They ain't got no love for Snowfall. <laughs> Goodfellas, doggone pop culture. Uh, but we're held to a higher standard, like Melissa said, like you yeah. being the representation of all black people in your job, right? Is that you have to really live above, way above reproach. Listen. Because if you don't, then it's going to be bad for the rest of us, exactly. right? And it's like, why do you have to represent everybody? Right. And it's like, we have to be the standard that we have to be extra good just to be accepted. Yeah. That's true. And I definitely felt the pressure to um, like put the race on. So that way, of course, I know my job was going to close, but if I decided to quit or if I left or mm -hmm. whatever, they would be, oh, we could hire another black woman because Melissa was really good. Yeah. We didn't have a bad experience with one black woman, which means we can no longer hire any. I need Melissa to be the good representation. So that way, mm -hmm. if another black woman fills in the application, they associate that with we hired one that was really good. That's I can so hire true. another. And that weight is heavy. Yeah. Oh, so heavy. It is. So That's heavy. that tokenism. It's not yeah. really. It is. Mm -hmm. And there is definitely a weight associated with that. Last question, and then we're going to let you go, Dr. Um, Ann Louise. Mm -hmm. I think this was really, really helpful. I definitely uh, felt like I learned quite a bit. When we are having these conversations we talked about celebrating and the history and um you know the examples and all of those things how do we also ensure that our um uh, school age children aren't feeling away about their white peers after we've taught them yeah. the reality yeah. of the situation how do we balance that with ensuring that they don't feel like I got to look at all my white friends with the sad eye. I know that's, that's such a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a tough situation, it right? Is. Because how can you not after hearing the history and then you're like, mm -hmm. yeah. So <laughs> what I would say, <laughs> what I would say is to allow them to have conversations with you about how they feel first, because they may not feel that kind of way. Right. Um, again, kids are much more, why I love working with them so much is they're much more resilient and forgiving and understanding than adults will ever be, yeah. honestly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we could educate them on all this stuff and they may not even, even think about it. And so I think that's where we ask them, how do you feel about all the stuff that I've taught you about, that you've learned about, that you've seen on the media? How do you feel about it? And I would say first come at, a, from a perspective of just asking them, just asking them. Because if they'd be like, well, it was nice. Thanks for the education. Bye. <laughs> you know, like yeah. then, then we're good. 
But if they're like, oh my gosh, I feel traumatized by the weight of the oppressive system and I don't want to go back to school, then you'd be like, okay, then let's talk more about that. And to know that, you remember, not all white people are racist. Racist people are racist. Racist yeah, people are racist. the thing, and also a, a thing I've thought about: not all white people are racist, right? But a lot of white people benefit from racism. Yes, correct. Right? right. They benefit from those structures, even if they're not racist themselves. White right. privilege, you don't have to acknowledge it for you for it to exist. You don't even notice exactly. that it's happening exactly. for you. So we're asking you to just say, "Hey, just." And somebody was saying, uh, I think it was a comedian. He was saying, "You know why it's so hard for black for white people to believe the police." are brutal to them, to, to black people. They haven't done anything wrong because police would never do that to white people right. if they hadn't done anything right. wrong. The real so they assume different. that you've had to, to be treated that ridiculously, you have had to have done something wrong because they can't fathom mm -hmm. a world and when a police officer would just stop them for walking, throw them up against a thing, take their ID. You know, I remember this, I was reading this article, this police had wrote anonymously when he was like, actually we are all trash type of thing. Mm. And he was yeah. saying when he stopped a group, group of black kids, he would ask for their ID and they had one, he would take it so that the next time they got stopped by a police officer, they wouldn't have ID and he'd have an easier wow. reason to arrest them. Wow. Things like that where you don't even think about that stuff happening because it never would happen to you. Right. You don't have a, mm -hmm. like, a fear of police because for the most part, they're not going to violence. treat you wrong just because of the color of your skin. Right. It's not that white people aren't treated poorly by the police, but they're not usually treated poorly by the police just because of the color of their skin. Correct. You know correct. what I mean? There was a video yesterday, a dog on white person shot at police with an AK-47. Oh, wow. Like, bro, take it in. Yeah. Dylan Roof, they took him to Burger King. And George Floyd was killed in the streets over a $20 bill. Right. They knew Dylan Roof had killed people right. already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and he's, he got food on the way to, I mean, that's, right. it's mind boggling. Yep. You know what peacefully. I mean? Right. It's it's my the man murdered nine people and George yes. Floyd allegedly used a a counterfeit bill. Right. And only one of them was killed in the street by wow. police. Wow. It's terrible. And that's, and that's the difference between the individual racism you're talking about, Kevin, and then the institutional and structural racism. Right. Because right. Th that's how people benefit. That's how white people benefit from it. And so when people, white people say, well, I'm not racist, it's like, right, but you benefit from the structural institutional policies yes. that allow you to live in this world differently. And I think that's where we have to, that is hard to explain to little kids. They don't get it. When they become junior high, high schoolers, they'll get it a little bit more. But that's where metaphors and analogies are the best way to explain things to kids. So, so like, even if they talk about protests, right? They're like, well, we need to protest this stuff, mommy. You know, you know, we need to go out into the streets. Why do people protest? Any of those things you can say, you know, just like how you may have a fit and a tantrum to get mm. my attention, mm. people have a right to protest. It is a right. And so they, people protest because they don't feel heard. But when they go to protest, people hear them, don't they? So again, we're not judging, we're just saying we're making a comment. And so anything you tell, talk to your kids about, if you can use like an analogy, a metaphor, an image, an example, even from like a movie, a scene from a movie, those are things like I even use with my kids, like when Taka and, and Tafiti, you know, why was Taka like tripping? Well, because she was angry and because she wasn't feeling heard, but when she felt loved and she like warmed up, like any of those kinds of things, mm. use those images and those scenes from movies and books kids get that they're, they're able to bring it in more. Like I remember even watching GI Joe as a kid, right? It was all these learning is half the battle is these metaphors of things to be able to tell a story. That's how kids learn best. So I say if always default Zootopia, back to metaphors and stories. That's good. Yes, Zootopia is talking about racism, yes, classism. Yes, I mean, I was Rachel watching that. Is. Remember me and yeah. Liz were like, is, are they talking to me and Liz yeah. or the kids? Yeah, we're great movie. It was so obvious. And Kung Fu Panda, the elimination of the pandas in terms of because of what they had and stripping them of their land. Oh, I guess a lot of there's yeah. a lot of deepness in these movies. So you could watch you could watch those movies with kids and then explain some of these concepts. They'll be more able to understand it. Yeah. Because they get it. They get it. I I I've heard What's the Will Smith movie where he's a shark or there was a shark movie? Shark, shark Tank. Shark. Actually, I've heard that was about being gay because he was supposed to yes. be a murderer or something. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. wasn't like totally. everybody else. Yeah. I was that Shark Tale? I think it was. That Shark Tale. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, mm -hmm. I didn't get that at first uh, watch. I did instantly. Yeah, that's good. You're yeah. the doctor. I'm, I'm just, I'm a regular boy. 
the 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 last thing that but I a lot of movies a lot of good movies are very like the quality X-Men. ones yeah the, the with the kids stuff they will really do a lot of underlying messages that kids will catch and that's where you go to that's how you can explain some of these tough concepts with the character or the you know the struggle that kind of stuff yeah x-men mm-hmm. civil oh, rights X-Men. black people x-men is martin yeah. luther king as uh, professor x malcolm as magneto yeah. neither is really wrong but mm-hmm. what, how how the government treated mm. mutants mm-hmm. it, it's parallels to black people oh wow yeah and stanley said that's what he recorded he recreated those characters to show the oppressive state of people and black wow. people specifically yeah oh, stanley yep uh, Stanley was he was woke, man. Yeah, he was, he was. woke apparently, Chad. <laughs> the last thing that I wanted to say before we close out when regards to analogy, I think I, I use analogies quite a bit actually with my mm-hmm. kids. I just realized that we were having a conversation with Isaiah not that long ago. Um, and we were asking him about his stance on Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. And one of the things that you said that was really good is not giving judgment and simply having the conversation. I think that's so important because I always want to allow my kids to be free thinking. It's one of the uh, biggest criticisms that I actually have for Twitter. I think it's a lot of group think and a lot of mob think on that platform. And so I stay away from it so I can like kind of form my own opinions. And I want my kids to have the ability to form their own opinions, especially when I think about the way that I grew up, a lot of it was just taking in whatever my parents told me as mm-hmm. fact and truth, and I mm-hmm. didn't deviate any differently. So anyway, I say all that as a backdrop because he comes in and we're like having this conversation because it was when we were protesting. So we were asking him about his feelings. And, you know, have you heard about All Lives Matter versus Black Lives Matter? What do you feel? And he was like, well, I feel like, you know, all lives do matter. We were like... We was like, oh... I have failed to... Pack you. your back. <laughs> <laughs> Just pack your bags. Ill you been delivered. <laughs> pack your bags. <laughs> <laughs> your bags. <laughs> so funny, but uh, we really were kind of like, okay, hold on. We have failed you. But also like just taking the moment of saying, okay, so explain to me. And of course the idea on the outside, all lives, it makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah. It makes sense. And so then we explain the analogy that's going on, on, um, on the Facebook. House. The house one. about the house analogy if there's one yes. house on fire why would we waste water spraying the whole block we would just give the attention to the house that's on fire and so using the example that you know black lives right now are under fire they are under siege yeah. and we're the ones that need the attention and so he got that yeah. and i think those again the idea of analogies the, yes. the idea of not like boy what you want to do boy you are crazy mm-hmm. like that is anti-black let's have a conversation first of all right. you anti-black yeah. <laughs> that's what you want to do, but it's really right. Important. But that will shut them down. So don't exactly. do that. Right? And that's what it'll do. It'll <laughs> shut them down. So let's yes. not um, pass judgment. Let's have an open, honest dialogue and then allow your kid to get to thinking and mm-hmm. let their wheels kind of start spinning and they start mm-hmm. making their connections on their own. And I told him, I said, anytime, I did say this, anytime you're making these connections on your own, I think that's great. But come have a conversation with mom and daddy. Make sure they line up after, with us. So that way we can provide you sometimes with context that you may not understand yes. your friends may not have and this will help you frame and inform your opinions a little bit even if you decide after having the conversation you disagree with us that's okay but at least now it's based on something that's informed and not just like yes of course all lives matter because yeah. that's right. wrong <laughs> and remember too that kids are concrete and literal right so literally all lives do matter Right. That's literal, right? That's right. Because so, if you say Black Lives Matter to them concretely, they think you're saying only Black Lives sure. Matter. But That's when you use the analogy, you're saying no, it's because we are under fire and people are acting as if they don't look at the history. Right? Yeah. Right? So, it's not only, yeah. it's so also. always keep it in mind. Right. So it's good. Also, so it's good. not only. It's yeah. not only. It's all. And he, because he had heard about Trayvon Martin and, and all these other things, he was like, oh. Yes. Got I, it. Got it. Mm-hmm. And honestly, Shoot, there's not a lot of, they don't even go to school with a lot of white people. No, it no. is them and Mexican kids. That's it. Yeah. So they don't, they're, the white kids are actually the minorities in their mm-hmm. school. There's okay. very few yeah. white, uh, white kids at their school. So um, 
so they don't have the, you know, that's actually one thing Melissa and I talked to moved to a different neighborhood. And we were like, man, they finna be going to school. All these white children and rich white children. Yeah. Like, we, we going to Inglewood. We, we need y'all to go back to, <laughs> we going to Inglewood. We need y'all to go to school where Issa and them and Molly grew up. We need y'all to go to school with the blacks. Yeah. At least the Mexicans. But, but all the whites? Oh, no, man. I say no. I say no. <laughs> Anyway, I think that this was a fantastic episode. I definitely learned um, quite a bit. So I think, much. I think those, the buckets, having the conversations, recognizing um, that kids are understanding color differences as early as six months. So it's really never too early. It's just about framing those conversations. We don't have to traumatize our kids. We can start off with the celebrations and then simply defining. And then as they get older, um, using real life exam. I mean, you can use history, but you have to some yeah. stuff going on in the news right now today and using those mm -hmm. examples especially if you are going out protesting using those as an yes. opportunity to sit your kids down and say this is the reason why this is important these are impactful important yeah. conversations that will help frame i remember when my parents did this and i get asked us remember he, when we were going to protest he was like in a During pandemic COVID? we were like boy let me tell you what this racism is, takes a backseat to no one yes Yes. You know, so so really good. Yeah. And people I are mean, paying attention. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you so thank much. You. Again, I thank apologize you. for thank my you. excitement. A lot of times I just no, forget this is I love an it. interview. Yeah, it was good. And I just be talking like we at the house. <laughs> yeah, and I, I okay, so doctor, tell me what it is about the racism. <laughs> I try to reel us back in, but then people will come after me, Melissa, let him talk. No, nah, okay, man. I was messing up. It's because all good. I yeah, really good. struggled through this. I remember one time we were talking, I don't remember who we were talking to them about. And I, I, I've, I'm learning more to let my, feel my feelings. Man, I broke down crying. Joe was crying. Melissa was had a tear. And Isaiah didn't cry. Yeah, he was and he held me. And I was, uh, uh, I mean, I'm here. <laughs> Shoulders. I was doing the bankhead bounce with my cry. <laughs> And uh, and I didn't want to show my son's weakness, but I realized that that's not weakness. And I've got to get rid of those old ideologies of crying exactly. equals weak and stuff. But it was a lot. It is a lot. Is but a that lot. particular day, it was uh, it was just love, the weight just be too heavy sometimes. It it just be mm -hmm. too heavy to hold it in. It's, it was a liquid expression of feelings. Um, but that I remember growing up, my dad. I remember him crying one time. Mm -hmm. His dad had died, and it was like four months after his dad died. We were pull. I mean, this is a vivid memory. We were pulling up the church um, hill to park. And he just broke down in tears driving. And I was like, this is an unusual yeah. thing. You're a crybaby, <laughs> is what I initially thought. <laughs> like, because he never did that, I, I thought of my dad as strong. And since he never cried, sure. I thought strong men don't cry. Right. As opposed to a strong man cries because he's strong and the world is heavy and he's trying to carry it. Right. right? So that right. difference of, and he never even said that. He sure. didn't say crybaby, none of that stuff. I just associated him with a good, strong man and he didn't cry, right. you know, mm -hmm. and that's a, having a father in the home. We don't even have a lot of, um, a, a lot of us don't have fathers in the homes or the ones who are in there are trying to do what my dad, right. you know, did. So anyway, we're all off topic. But. It's okay. This was really, really, um, as I'm Thank yawning, you. I usually don't. Um, I mean, when are you available to come to our kids right. and talk to them via zoom? <laughs> I can do it anytime. Anytime. Perfect. We will pay. We're like, hey, kids, meet the doctor. She's going to tell you about the racism. Right. Thank you, guys. Thank you <laughs> Thank so you. much. Thanks for inviting me. Um, can you give out your um, website and your Instagram for those that are interested in following? I know you also said that you do workshops. So if people want to sign up for those, I think this is a great place to include all of that information. Of course. Thank you so much for that. So you can find me on my website at a new day sa.com. So a new day sa as in San Antonio.com. Um, my Instagram, which I'm very active on, is dr.annelouise.lockhart. So Dr. Anne Louise Lockhart. And then uh, I have a conference coming up. It's my first online parent conference. Oh, congratulations. Actually. Thank you. I'm very excited. We just launched um, just last night, um, but it'll be starting on August 17th. And you can find that at, uh, on Instagram at yana.retreat. So you are not alone, retreat. Um, Yana dot retreat and uh, it'll be for parents and it'll be talking about stuff with culture and you know getting past a lot of those generational things as well as all the important things like finance sleep co-regulation working with teens all that kind of stuff 
So I'm very excited about that. Very nice. I love this. Thank yes. you so very much. Actually, when Thank you said you. that, I just remembered, I think you sent me a DM and it, I was not in a good space. So um, we can have this conversation later. Thank you okay. so very much, Dr. Anne Louise Lockhart. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Thank I you, will Melissa. definitely Thank you. Thank you. go ahead. Thank I don't know what to say. Thank you so much. And listen, Patreon people, I did not take that as a slide. I really was cutting her off. So I, I, I appreciate the, the direct but, feedback. Yeah, no, it was good. It was good feedback. Yeah. And I, I, I know y'all ain't coming from a place of like yeah, disrespect. Yeah. And, and thank you, Dr. Ann Louise. I'm, I haven't been saying your name because I messed it up so much early that I don't want to mess up again. <laughs> but thank you so much because this is, we'd love to have you back. I obviously That's feel like there's so much we can talk about um, as, as things change and stuff. And I'm just honestly really glad as a people that we are talking about therapy as, as, as normal as mm -hmm. going to the doctor when you have a cold. Like when mm -hmm. we were growing up, it was not like that. Mm -hmm. And part of it was we didn't have access, so you had to have Jesus, because I can't pay for no therapist. It's the only option. Jesus was the only thing that was free. <laughs> therapy would have hidden for the one fifth. So I'm so glad, like, you know, when our, our son went to a couple of sessions, they, they, hey, dad, where are you going? I'm going to therapy in the garage. Mm -hmm. And they, that's, and I come out better, you know, I talk to them about it. I feel like they will have less of a reason to go exactly. or, or to not want what, to go because right. it's like, oh yeah, my dad, man, he was talking about therapy all the time. Mm -hmm. When I was, you know, during that pandemic, he was in that garage mm -hmm. going to therapy. Yeah. They don't know what I'd be crying yeah. in there. No shame. There's no shame. dark in that yeah. garage. I don't want nobody to see my tears. It'd be warm. My eyes be warm with the with the tears well thank you again Dr. thank you Lockhart. um i hope you guys enjoyed this episode until the next one bye bye, bye. bye. thanks